This is Hunter Muse. And this is Chris Snipes. And you are listening to The Melt. Definitely. So, uh, first of all, everybody knows my name is Nathaniel Gillis. I was born and raised in the evangelical movement. My first encounter with the phenomenon occurred when I was eight years old. My parents moved into a new house, and uh, I was actually at the, the original tour of the home prior to purchasing it that I witnessed a full bodied apparition of a little girl in a room that would become mine, essentially. And uh, that was my very first time uh, experiencing whatever it is we're dealing with. And then once we moved into the house, I tell people, and it's true, the uh, the entity evolved, it mutated. It, it wasn't a little girl at all. That's what it appeared to be uh-huh. at a first blush. Uh, but once I moved into the house, it, it turned into a shadow figure. Uh, it turned into a, a, a ball, like almost like a, a dark cloud in the, in the corner of the room. Mm. And uh, so very strange stuff. Uh, it was, at the time, was horrifying. Um, sleep paralysis paralyzing terror all of the above and uh that's what uh in, inspired me to get involved in this research mm-hmm. and it, it ended up being instrumental in my life you know I, I try to help people as much as i can uh, but that's what got me into this field gotcha did that stuff continue happening after you left that house or was that just specific to that location one time one time of course it was nothing as malevolent as it was in that location but uh, we moved about 30 minutes north uh, from that house. And then uh, it's weird. My, my aunt Shelly had passed away and I was grieving her loss one night. It was raining. I can, I can still remember vividly the rain hitting the window when the radio that I was listening to fuzzed in and out and I could hear my aunt coming through. Uh, I knew it was her voice, but I could not, uh, I could not understand what she was saying. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that, Obviously, that freaked me out. And yeah. weird enough, weirdly enough, I should say, that was during the time when White Noise, the movie, came out. And I had no idea what that was. So once I finally realized what I was experiencing or what I thought I was experiencing, yes, very strange. So the paranormal activity did follow me, um, but thankfully it stopped. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I did not encounter paranormal activity unless I was in a haunted house where I was doing an investigation. So personally, yes. that's when it stopped for me, thankfully. Well, hearing that voice, did that, now knowing what you know, do you think that that was actually her? Or do you think that was know. something, okay, kind of hard to tell. You can't look for, yeah, you can't ask for an ID. <laughs> right, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and, you know, truthfully speaking, I don't think we can trust it. Um, we know the phenomenon or whatever we're dealing with can mask itself as uh, deceased ancestors or ghosts. Mm-hmm. even to the point of telling us what they want us to hear, what we want to hear from them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've known people, medium psychics, who for 26 years, you know, they thought they were working with Dear Aunt Edna until Dear Aunt Edna tells them to do something that went against their religious creed. Mm-hmm. Yes. And they realized that was just, they were being, it was bait to them. They were essentially yeah. being led astray. So I don't really know what it was. I did not try to communicate with it. More than anything, it freaked me out. Uh, because as soon as that happened, I had a, a glass of water that was sitting on a bar stool. And uh, as soon as that happened, the glass flew and it slammed against the wall and broke. And I ran to my parents' room freaking out. So I don't know what it was. Um, but uh, thankfully, that was the last paranormal activity I've experienced where I'm living. Mm-hmm. How old were you when that happened? 15. Wow. Yeah. But the initial experience was when you were eight, right? Correct. Okay. Gotcha. Correct. 
Now, I have a personal question to ask you, and obviously you don't have to answer it if you don't feel comfortable answering it, but were you a virgin at this time? Yes, of course. Okay. At eight, I hope Ra so. Raised in Pentecostalism, oh my God, uh, yeah. I, I had friends that smoked dope. Um, at that time, I, I didn't even know what it was. You know, I was very, very sheltered, mm. uh, which is all the more troubling considering how the entity manifested to me in my house at eight years old. Can, can I go into that real quick? I don't know. Sure, it's still. very, very interesting because it manifests manifested pathology. And I think that's what's most fascinating about this phenomenon. I'm not interested in titles. Okay, we can place masks on them and place the face on the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. What are they doing, right? I think that's the most important aspect. But uh, when I was eight years old, I would go into nightmares. And uh, it was terrifying because the nightmare was a loop. It was a running loop. Mm -hmm. It was always in black and white. And knowing that I had no context to drug addiction or suicidal ideation, right. eight years old, right? I'm playing video games. I'm playing my Game Boy Caller here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the nightmare included me walking up to a shelter in a park and seeing two young men, maybe about 20 years old, uh, sitting on a picket table with their backs turned towards me. The one on the right was had, had a needle in his left arm. I didn't even know what insulin was, mm. right? And so he never paid any attention to me. The, the, the man on the left did. He turned around, made eye contact with me, pulled out a black 357 Magnum, put it in his mouth, pulled the trigger, and instantly I would wake up. And when I would wake up at nighttime, there would be the stench that filled the room. Mm. Um, you know, and it, even as young as I was, you know, my laundry was clean. I kept my room clean. Uh -huh. My mom would blister my tail if I didn't. So I knew it wasn't me leaving, I don't know, a banana in the room or something. It wasn't something right. that came from reality in a sense. It was mm -hmm. supernatural, if you will, and uh, strange. But, um, you know, that's what inspired me to get into this. And, and first of all, it really made me reconsider these manifestations. What, first of all, why was I fearful? Of it? Was it because I didn't understand it? Mm -hmm. Or was it fabricating terror on me to feed? Yes. Yeah. Right. Good point. Right. And that's, that's really where I started. Well, I think the energy that a child has is very different from the energy of an adult. And so mm -hmm. I think the reason, one of the reasons that children have these experiences is because there's a purity of that energy and it is uh, perhaps uh, more delicious to these nefarious spirits or these nefarious energies that, and they're seeking that. So that, that moment of um, horror or surprise or any kind of a emotional nuance that you have other than regular joy or happiness is a super attractor. 100%. Yeah, it was uh, like a moth to the flame. It was, it was, it was, it was a wild experience. Um, I could story like, I'll tell you what, sometimes like I, I've forgotten a lot of what happened. Like sometimes like, like last year, my mom told me, you know, one night you ran into the room saying there was a witch that entered your room. I said, what? I, I had no memory of that whatsoever. So there, there was stuff that I still, to this day, I have stuck in me sure. that I don't, I don't have cognizance of. And so, but um, yeah, I mean, more than anything, again, it, it taught me a lesson. Not, number one, I can't trust everything I see. Right. And that there is a purity that they're hungry for. It's not just, okay, it's not even just our attributes, but it's, mm -hmm. again, feeding off of fear. And I've, I've, I've had entities and cases where the entities will construct entire scenarios of trauma just to use that as a mortal portal to enter into our world and to feed on us, which is another disturbing aspect. Very dark, um, but I think it's the research has to be done regarding that field. How did your parents react? Yeah, I was going to ask that. No understanding of it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, at that particular time, there were a lot of things going on in their marriage, in my life, uh, their lives. They, my dad was working, uh, I think, two jobs. My mom was working. And so my dad was getting up at 4.45 in the morning. Uh, and then you have this little kid, right, freaking out, dragging his mattress and waking them up, mm -hmm. saying, hey, there's something in my room. He didn't really understand uh, what was going on. Matter of fact, it wasn't until we were loading out the U-Haul and moving that my dad told me, I believe some, someone died in that house. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it, it wasn't uncommon, especially downstairs in the basement, it wasn't uncommon for you to hear some weird things occurring, footsteps, or, or even just the feeling of being watched. Mm -hmm. Something was there watching us. And uh, he actually admitted to that later on. Uh, now, again, I don't know why there wasn't more involvement on their part. It's, and I don't hold a grudge or anything. I think mm -hmm. the teacher's always silent when the test is being taken. I had to go through that sure. in order to, to get into this field. And um, here I am, guys. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think that growing up in, a, in that sort of religious context had something to do with the template you would later put on what most people are calling aliens and, and, and classifying them or maybe – taking it into account that these things actually might be demons, demonic? Um, yes and no. I think it's a paradox here. Uh, the, the movement I grew up in had no framework for the demonic outside of laying on of hands mm -hmm. and casting them out. They didn't even believe in holy water, mm -hmm. uh, much less aliens. Now, my hypothesis stems from ancient literature and what our ancestors considered to be demonic. Now, what's happening today is that we are reinterpreting an ancient phenomenon in a modern way, simply trying, again, in a feeble attempt to place a face on it. We're still groping in the darkness, but I, I can tell you right now, the case studies speak for themselves. There is nothing right now that is occurring in modernity, specifically with regarding this phenomenon that has not occurred in antiquity. Mm -hmm. The problem is we're calling it different things and we are compartmentalizing mm -hmm. the phenomenon. I myself uh, have, have uh, witnessed and been a part of incubi cases where if you set an experiencer at one end of the table and you set an incubi victim on the other end, the pathology is the same, mm -hmm. the victimology is the same. More, more specifically, the sexual pathology is glaringly obvious. Mm -hmm. Now, now where my, what my research has led me to is the fact that there seems to be a singular intelligence that has manipulated our species for millennia that has led us to believe it's either demonic or alien. Mm -hmm. Not really, not really leading us. Okay, hey, is there a, a, another intelligence behind both masks that is working both against each other because it does not want us to understand what's going on? Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to ramble, uh, but you guys are asking such great questions. Oh, we're we're here for you to ramble. This is the whole mm -hmm. point. Do you think that there's some cultural mores that are involved there? So if your yeah. culture comes from perhaps more of a religious background, you're going to see it as something demonic where if maybe you had kind of more of a new age uh, upbringing, you would see it as an alien experience and, or that's the mask that's being used because that's the one mm -hmm. that you will accept. Or even atheist. I don't think so. Again, um, these beings manifested as demons. Mm -hmm. That's a very important component to the field that people are ignoring mm -hmm. very much. So, um, see, okay, what is a demon? In antiquity, a demon was essentially a negative spirit, mm -hmm. a species of spirit. Now, if we're going to get into their pathologies, uh, what's more demonic than sexual assault? Oh, right. See, that's what they were doing. And so that's mm -hmm. why these people, okay, I'm going to, what is this? Um, so I do not believe that there is some benign issue occurring. There's mm -hmm. nothing benign about someone who's taking a day nap, like Dr. Claire Turner's experiences were taking a day nap and some translucent being hovers over her and takes over her body. Mm. Now, there's now there could be certain cultural issues there where we project our ignorance upon that certain circumstance. Right. But at the end of the day, it is not good. Yeah. So whether or not we want to hypothesize, OK, are they demonic or alien? I have a uh, research done that says that they worn both masks where you could, they would step into the role and play that to the team. As long as you and I don't look beyond the veil and see what's really going on. That's so interesting. I, today is the anniversary, the four year anniversary of my mother's death. And I, you know, she had very clear ways of communicating with me that, once she had passed within the first 24 hours that she passed. And I've had subsequently had dreams about her where in the dream, I realized it wasn't her. It was something else that had put on her costume, meaning like a hairstyle that she had at one point in her life. Uh, her eyes were completely black 
And my mother had the antithesis of that. She had a clear blue eyes. So mm -hmm. I recognize in the dream, oh, this is something that's trying to engage my attention. That's trying to give some imagery that they perceive that I will respond to. But I, right. I immediately felt repelled by that. What do you think the proper protocol is in a dream when you have that experience? We're still groping in the darkness. My colleagues and I are looking for a way to test the spirits. Really, we are. Um, now, the problem is the knowledge base regarding us, the species, is transcendent. They're eclipsing everything. Um, I've had cases where they have appeared as dead people. Um, they've appeared as, like I said, Pierre and Edna or, or uh, boyfriends that people have been intimate with. I mean, at one case in India where one being manifested as seven, seven different boyfriends. The problem is that even if we consider the fact, okay, uh, how could I test them? Maybe they'll tell me something that only me and my loved one know. The fact is they know that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, their knowledge base, if you compare knowledge bases to each other regarding the demonic and the alien, it's the same. Mm -hmm. They know when people are going to die. They know what they're, what clothes they've died in, um, which is disturbing. Uh, so they have access to us in an ontological way that we really can't quantify at this point. How do they know? Where are they getting this information from? Um, but to my, my knowledge, and this gets into some of the uh, experience or research, it's like when people see Jesus. Uh, okay, and there's one experience. Like, okay, Jesus, uh, Jesus told me that Ra is God. Now, uh, what happens is we have the first century writings of, of Yeshua or Jesus' teachings. If you compare what that Jesus is teaching compared to what the Jesus taught, there is usually an inconsistency there. Mm -hmm. Just like the individual whose grandmother was there, you know, or his mother, right? It, if it does something or says something that goes against what you know, that individual would have never said, never done, would have never told you to do then you realize that this is nothing but a mask and you are being baited in obeying but obeying them uh it's just like uh these experiential case studies i read one a little girl was in bed at night and she hears her mother's voice calling her in the living room mm -hmm. and uh this is what disturbs me you know people say these are not threat okay let somebody else do that to your kid come on right and uh you know and he, the little girl says okay it's my mother it's clearly her voice and so she walks out of the in the hallway and she sees both of her parents in suspended animation in the bathroom and then the voice is it coming from her mother's mouth coming from the corner of the room where another being is wow so this mimicking aspect is one of the more troubling aspects of the world. It's, it's it's just weird mm -hmm. <laughs> and i don't like it I'll just put it out there. <laughs> Understandably. Uh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I was just going to just very quickly sidestep into something that is on your bio that nobody ever asks you about in interviews, but what preternatural epiphenomenal philosophy is. Yeah. It's, it's a very compelling combination of work. <laughs> well, it's a, I've been trying to take it out of my, my bio, so I've actually updated <laughs> it, but people keep okay. finding the old one. Um, no, essentially, early on in my research, I was uh, studying parapsychology, and a lot of these people, um, what they're doing is they're, they're taking what's called epiphenomenon. Now, epiphenomenon is different than phenomenon in the sense that epiphenomenon is a secondary consequence or a secondary action to something or someone. It's not the person in itself. I, I liken it to somebody being in a pool of water and another person entering the pool and you're looking at the waves. And so what we have re as researchers have been doing is documenting the waves, thinking we're documenting the entity. We're not. Yeah. And so that's what happened to our ancestors. We were groping in the darkness. And so we applied descriptions to them. Right. Not definitions. And so it's like when we see or feel a cold front in a haunting. Is that the entity? Or matter of fact, I'll go even deeper. When we see apparitions that are being projected by the orb itself, mm -hmm. we've been focusing on the apparition. Meanwhile, the actual entity is somewhere else in that room. And so that's a little bit of an introduction to that. Gotcha. So it's like a shadow show. Like they're look over here. They're trying to distract you with something, while maybe something else much more sinister is going on in the other part of the room or house. Or absolutely, it's absolutely. It's not what they're wanting us to remember it's what they're wanting us to forget that's important mm -hmm. yeah are, and do screen memories play a lot i mean because that that uh, comes up a lot in ufo encounters are they it, in com 
yeah, it comes um, it comes into play in a lot of the phenomena. Uh, Dr. Carla Turner had a case study where, uh, and I just talked about this on my show, where a woman was at a cookout, a barbecue, and uh, her and her friends witnessed this UFO hovering over a neighbor's house. And uh, this woman vividly remembers pulling out binoculars and staring at this object. Matter of fact, hey, Barbara, grab a beer, look at this thing in the sky. So she pulls out this telescope and they're looking at this, this thing in the sky. And she says, the problem is I didn't own binoculars. And she said, when I woke up the next day, my telescope was still in the box. It was shifting. Crazy. So again, it's not what they're wanting us to remember. It's their, what they're wanting us to forget. That's the problem. Do you think that there's any element of this that is a government project? Is there people who talk about, you know, my labs and, you know, alien experiences that may not necessarily be extraterrestrial? Do you think that that's possible? I mean, there's some there, demons there, yeah. in the in the government for sure. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> oh, I know for sure. Um, I will say this, that there is a strange correlation with UFO abductees, UAP abductees, and some sort of shadow government. Uh, this gets into the Collins Elite research where they had a lady, Judy Doherty, I believe, was her name. And uh, she experienced an abduction encounter in her car. She sees this, this, this UFO hovering above the power lines. She gets out of her car, looks at it, and instantaneously, now she's in two places at once, it's triggered by location in her. And now she's in the craft looking down at her own body. Mm. Wow. And so the next morning, she's uh, she's awoken by a knock at the door, opens the door. It's a government official. Hi, Judy. Hey, just want to pull you aside. Um, have you been having nightmares about being kidnapped out of your car? So literally being interrogated about a UFO encounter. So how, first of all, if that was our government, how would they know? Mm. Uh, a second second possibility is that it's it's them wanting mm -hmm. to know how much of the encounter we remember. Right. A lot of things are on the table here, um, but there does seem to be some sort of, and I'm not, I wouldn't even call it government. I think that there is a, a transcendent quality about sure. this shadow, I guess, whatever they are, uh, because uh, it's not just the United States. It's in it's in other other states. Uh, what is it? Other nation as well other countries so mm -hmm. i don't believe it's just us i think that there is another shadow government that's bigger that uh, we're encountering and a government might be a very anthroposophic no, right. that's not the word right. i'm looking for anthropomorphic way of, of putting that it, it might be right. more of a just a organization or a yeah I, I, who knows what any earthly term probably couldn't begin to comprehend it absolutely we're we're, we're lacking vocabulary here <laughs> mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, I mean, how do you find the real? I mean, there's uh, you 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 can peek behind curtain after curtain after curtain, but you always suspect that there's many more that we don't even have access to. Right, and there does seem to be a power structure, a control mechanism being employed. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Uh, it's so funny because it's not just that that people are being visited by officials. That represents some sort of uh, organized whatever. Um, I've I've had case studies where I've been on an investigation, and I'm knocking on the door, and I'm looking through the window at the couple, and they're looking at me, and I'm knocking on the door, waving, knocking on the door, for ten minutes. And finally, they call me because they're waiting on me. Thought I met like maybe I missed the appointment or something. And I'm like, no, you know, I'm right here. I'm right outside. And so there are times when phenomenon will susp seemingly suspend laws of nature merely to stop us from understanding what's going on in this power structure. It doesn't want us to remember. And if we, if it, we do remember something, it doesn't want us to remember the correct event. And if we do remember the correct event, it doesn't want us to tell anybody. Um, and uh, we've seen with Dr. Carla Turner, Barbara Bartholik, and other whistleblowers who've come out it, it, get, it can get dangerous very quickly for people. Yeah, it's interesting when you when you take all of this stuff into an account, into account, and there's all of this talk about 
we live in a simulation or we live in an enclosed reality you know, under a under a firmament or something like that or that physical reality in and of itself is the experiment and uh the or sort of the orchestrators or the choreographers of all this are the ones that are maybe these entities or these entities are a, a, a sliver of all of this vast network of stuff that may be just playing with us, you know, maybe just pushing us, seeing how they can push us, seeing how they can manipulate us or seeing how they can harvest, which I've heard you talk about this energy from us, which mm -hmm. seems to be intensified, intensified by, by fear or negative energy. Yeah. The simulation model is something that I've been playing with lately mm -hmm. um, because the phenomenon itself, it evolves in order to evade. It evolves in order to evade it. And in most cases, it, it evolves according to our awareness of it, mm -hmm. which is very curious. Uh, if you want me to be a demon to you, I will be. If yeah. you want me to be an alien to you, I will be an alien. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's no more an alien than it is Mickey Mouse, because Mickey Mouse is abducting children, right? But if you look beyond the veil, you'll start to see that there does seem to be a singular intelligence that is manipulated. And not just manipulated, uh, but it's used abduction or kidnappings um, to accomplish its end. Now, what are they? I don't know, right? I don't I have no idea. All I know is that there is something that's eclipsing every model we have. And I think that UFOlogy, let's just take that for example, they're going to have, they're going to have to put their boots on because the phenomenon itself is so much larger. Uh, and I know you guys had uh, other researchers on it. It's not nuts and bolts, right? It's mm -hmm. something much more conscious based. Exactly. And uh, I don't know. I think it's fascinating. It's, it's worth researching. Very fascinating. I do. I do think that there's an element of uh, the media that plays a very integral part to all of this. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you feel that or think that on some level there's uh, some mind control aspect that the media is using in with films in particular and in music where they're actually doing rituals to uh maybe play with this energy to play with the fear to uh, you know work with a mass of people to see how many how like what the frequency is and how they can uh perhaps capture that frequency yes i think what we're dealing with is the iceberg effect that's all we're seeing but that's not all that's there mm -hmm. and this 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 demonic symbolism that's being employed it's it's not without power you know what i mean and when you're looking at an iceberg obviously everybody knows what that is but you think you're seeing all of it there's something that's unseen that's present that's working what is made manifest and so uh, i believe that a lot of what we're dealing with are conjurations incantations or spellings Mm -hmm. uh, that it's not just, you know, put a rhythm to it, doesn't matter. It's the same thing. And in many cases, we, we don't know what these being, I mean, obviously we don't know, but in many cases, we're assuming that they're going to play by our rules. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, I look at this, and this is so, you know, uh, my intentions with them will determine their intentions with me. Now, what's so lazy about this is, and I'm just, sorry, what's lazy about this is, first of all, we wouldn't even employ that reasoning with strangers. We teach our kids, don't take candy from pre people you don't know, and yet we have people out there trying to conjure entities that are hanging out in the ether, just waiting to step into a role, to become something to someone, and then to just manipulate. Now, again, this, this, this deceptive nature of it all, uh, it's not good. Um, I'll go back to some case studies if I could. Uh, in the 16th century, the debug phenomenon, this is when these beings mutated into possession, becoming pregnancy, um, to where these people were, they were do, employing what we would consider to be CE5, essentially. Uh, they were meeting in gloomy sabbats, and they were going on mountaintops, and they were gathering together. And literally, this is quite fascinating, their philosophy mirrored to a T, the CE5 movement. If my purity is made manifest, their purity will respond to me. And wouldn't you know that women were being visited by beings in the middle of the night 
being induced in a dream state. Hello, you are full of darkness in the 16th mm -hmm. century. Mm -hmm. yep. And these individuals were thinking to themselves, okay, th this is not really an assault. It's just a nightmare. This is not really an entity. It's just a bad dream. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in antiquity, we'd call that a dream demon, mm -hmm. right? But uh, so, so then these people were waking up the next day, getting ready for work. They get to work and they start feeling sore. And they look and they have ligature marks on their hands mm -hmm. and wrists. Now, what that means is that was a real encounter. But the problem is, many in many cases, these beings conjure us more than we conjure them. And, and the gravitational pull by the phenomenon wants us to believe that once we conjure them, that they will play by our rules. Now, I would suggest that if they're not going to play by their rules, what makes us think they're going to play by ours? And is it dangerous? I, and I don't want to ramble. Sometimes I ramble. I was, honestly, I'm used to just speaking for hours. So I'm, if I ramble, just tell me to shut up. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna urge you to continue rambling. Actually, so okay. don't, don't feel self conscious about going on. Because you, you, well, you've got lots of great things to say. So, so these rules that they, they, they allegedly follow, uh, they do have rules. Now, one of, one of the things I'm quoted for is that they're playing by different rules because they're playing a different game. Mm -hmm. Now, yes. the rules in hauntology and conjurations, the rules that we were told they play by, draw a circle. They'll stay within the circle. Yes. And so our government, within the Collins Elite Research, they were conjuring them like 10 minutes from my house mm -hmm. at Wright Pat. We were employing the, uh, uh, what was it, the Parsons technique. Oh, yeah. And what was happening is upon the conjuration, the being would manifest in the circle and then beat the car out of everybody. So what that tells me, and this is, uh, Dr. Barry Fitzgerald also talks about this, but there, again, there is this fallacy of propaganda that they manipulate us through mm -hmm. where they will tell us, okay, you know what, if you do this, if you contribute, I'll stay within this framework. Meanwhile, the whole point is to get them here. And then once, once they're here, there are no rules to, yes. that we know of that they follow. So that, that highlights and further solidifies my point. We have, we have created rules that they allegedly follow, but they're not even following their own. So it's to our own detriment that we manipulate our consciousness to conjure them. Mm -hmm. Or are they conjuring us? And that is weird. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Well, there's definitely a symbiotic aspect to this. I think Absolutely. that you have to have some degree of uh, porousness or openness in order to be inhabited by something. And mm -hmm. I think that's where I, I find, you know, playing with things like Ouija board or, you know, it, you can e even do these things with a, just a regular deck of cards. You don't need to use right. a tarot deck. You can use a, you can use tea leaves. You can use lots of different devices to go into these realms and to interact with these other entities and these other energies. I think my concern is that now this has been made like a novelty where right. the, these objects are being sold or the, these uh, ideas are being sold as, you know, being fun and very benign and, you know, try this or play with this without really understanding the seriousness of that realm that you are diving into. Do also, you, what are your perspectives about uh, doing those types of things? Do you recommend that kids play with these types of games or do you think that it's opening them up? And if they are open, how do you close that door? Well, there's a lot there. Uh, I think that obviously I'm not, I, I do not propagate the necessity or even the interest of a, a Ouija board or a spirit board. I think more than anything, it, it, it draws us. It, it creates, us in us a mortal portal in which they manifest and that's always the age-old question are they manifesting to or are they manifesting through and the more that and that's that's really a system we're dealing with uh, mm -hmm. give me letters and i'll you know it's, it's our hands but it's something is leading us mm -hmm. um and this gets back into ancient idolatry 
and I hope I can make this connection clear. Um, in antiquity, in antiquity, idolatry consisted of not just worshiping deities or demigods, uh, but it was going to blacksmiths and literally telling them the entity, the image of the entity you have in your head. And the blacksmith would create that image in the metal, mm. carve it in the metal. And then that individual would then take that figurine or whatever you want to call it, place it into his house, go to, go to bed at night, kiss his wife good night, read his kids a bedtime story, go to bed. And in the middle of the night, that entity would begin to move in uh, that, that statue. And all of a sudden, something would step out of it. And so oh. the important thing is there is a mortal portal being employed here. And I can't stress this enough because it's extremely dangerous because long before the blacksmith molded the image, that entity molded the mind. Right. And so there is this calling, this, and, and this, we're getting into this too in a little bit, but there is a symbiotic and an embryonic connection between the mortal portal that is us. And I think that, uh, I do not, I do not, uh, I don't like uh, spirit boards. I, I've, I don't, I've never had experiences with it, but I had one case where an entity came through that spirit board, virtually possessed the woman, and she sold her soul to the devil, uh, which led her into about 25 years of addiction. She's clean now, but it's, uh, it took a lot to get that off of her. And um, there was at one point where I talked to the entity, his name was Christopher. And I talked to him and he told me, hey, listen, this is how it began. So there are there are things that are more expensive than people would like them to be. Mm. And, there, and it's not just words. Mm -hmm. Words are worlds. And sometimes uh, these beings will step into the words that are in that word. I'm in uh, university right now and I'm doing research. I'm actually doing a research project on uh, people who are having relationships with sex dolls and people who are having relationships with artificial intelligence. And there seems to be this segment of the population who is more interested in having a relationship with an inanimate object than with a human being. And the fascinating part of this research is that this has been going on for thousands of years. This is not a new right. phenomenon that that men were using what they called dames de voyage on ships. So they would sew, they would take cotton and different um, fabrics and sew this woman together, and then they would pass it among each other and have sexual intercourse with it or cuddle it at night. And, and there's different versions of that in, in different cultures. So what I'm wondering is, is it possible for that object to have some form of sentience because it has been engaged with as though it was a human? Yes. So this gets into which era literature. Um, and I mention this again, nearly every podcast. It's new to pe many people. And I think it does underscore what we're dealing with here. Uh, so in which era literature, the phenomenon was taking women on demonic flights. Mm. <laughs> well, <laughs> I always laugh at this because not that the subject matter is funny, but it's always funny to me when I hear people say, well, that didn't happen until the 60s. Okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Just tell me. Yeah, it's always funny. I'm like, all right, whatever. And I, you know, I have some of my heroes in the field that said that, but I tell you what, I'm going to be very blunt. Within five minutes, if somebody says that, I can tell how much research they've done. Mm -hmm. And I don't care who they are. It's like, okay. So, you know, in which our literature, uh, these beings, the phenomenon, I should say, were taking witches and manifesting to them as demons. Mm -hmm. horns, hooves, tails, pitchforks, whatever you want to call it, the whole thing, the whole thing. And uh, they had demonic husbands, and so the husband would get up in the nighttime and use the restroom or get a glass of water, and he thinks it's his wife sleeping next to him, and it's not. Um, their perception was that it was a familiar spirit or it was a copy of her that mm -hmm. was next to the husband. So the husband thinks that, okay, my wife's with me, whatever. No, she's been taking on a demonic flight. 
And in these demonic flights, they were taken to an undisclosed location. And uh, it's at that point that the phenomenon demonstrated an entire theatrical production that was tailored to the belief system of the experiencer. Hello, UFOs. Mm -hmm. And in this scenario, uh, these women are copulating. Okay, now, obviously, I'm not going to get graphic here, but they're thinking this is a demon, even to the point that they were thought they were having intercourse with de- uh, with, with corpses. Mm-hmm. And so, think about this: it, it's 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 manifesting to the to the sight, right? It's blinding them by their own vision. Mm. And essentially, this is crazy, but they're, they're going through all of the motions, all of the emotions, all of the sensations, up until something stopped. The frequency that was being used to employ this, this mechanism of deceit failed. Mm. And suddenly, that's not a demon. That's not a corpse. These women were looking around and they were being poked and prodded by metallic objects that were made according to the the measure of a man. Now, can I tell you, this is not in modernity. This is not in 2023. It's not in the 1960s. This is the phenomenon manifesting to and through witches according to their belief system. Now, what they realize, this is crazy too, because this gets into uh, excretions. but the but what was happening was they were being inseminated. Men were also sorcerers were also being taken on these demonic flights. Watch this, and later on being given children. This is your child. In one case, one young man he said, "How can I have a child when I'm a virgin?" So all we have to do is expect to swap it and say, "You know what? That's a UFO experiencer." And then we start to see the the larger aspect of what we're dealing with. And of course, you know where I'm going. That is that something has the desire to manipulate us according to its will, according to its agenda. But the, 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 the idea here, though, is that it was inseminating them by virtue of technology. And yet it was it, when it manifested to them, they could have sworn it was real. And so this is this is when we get into, OK, when they're extracting seed from men they're doing doing it to inseminate women Mm -hmm. now we demonology and demonologists would consider this because we compartmentalize the phenomenon that's incubi and succubi right what's what we're really dealing with though is it's essentially a series of events where one experiencer documents one thing another another and we've created entire fields of research regarding one picture right yes not realizing that this is something far larger and darker than we would even want to believe. Right. So this, all of these phenomena could be interrelated. And so you could throw right. in like pornography into that. So someone Absolutely. who, who is obsessively watching pornography, they could be basically being used as a vessel to take that energy mm-hmm. and then right. it's being stored somewhere else. So, so this, larger entity or this larger energy that we're talking about if you could name it would you say it's satan would you say it's lucifer Ooh. would you say like what it, do you think it's more technical than that that it is coming from maybe some other layer of reality well i think i call them molters that's what i call these things molters um, they will inhabit bodies. I think that's the whole purpose of harvesting semen and creating hybrids, placing their own consciousness in the fetus. Um, molters. Now, the, the working theory that I have is that these are mutated ghosts that we're dealing with a form of consciousness that has evolved and stepped out of the body. You could call it disembodied or disincarnate. Um, but whatever we're dealing with has access to the soul in a troubling way. And, and, and I think that's where their information comes from, the deepest recesses of our existence, the, mo- the most ontological part of our world. Mm-hmm. They can pick. 
And so if we are in fact dealing with beings that exist consciously in the afterlife but have bodies, now we start to understand why they know when people will die because they're in that world. They're, they have knowledge of that, but they have bodies. Um, this, this is also where a lot of researchers just fall apart because they project uh, Catholic demonology right. on this. And you start to see, oh my God, you know, the literature they know is limited. You know, they have to dig deeper and dive into much of a larger spectrum. Um, so, you know, but, but getting back to, to the uh, biological excretions, uh, Montague Summers and Sinestrari of Revamino, Father Sinestrari of Revamino, uh, both of them, uh, even Bernard of Gordon was a demonologist in the Middle Ages. Uh, all of these people recording instances where these beings uh, were hovering over the recently deceased and harvesting their excretions. Uh, Sinestrari even said they were milking the carcasses of the dead. And that was the first seed that they used to inseminate women. Now, this is what, this is why I grieve when people are saying, you know what, I'm a hybrid mother and all of this. And I want to pull them aside and help them understand something. This is not something to, to okay, aspire to. It's not like, mm -hmm. okay, oh my God, I'm a hybrid mother. It's a great thing. Because in many cases, the, the baby they're carrying came from a dead person. And the problem is we're not realizing that there's necromancy involved with this phenomenon. And even in Genesis 6 and biblical antiquity, a lot of these women were pregnant with angels, fallen angels. Mm -hmm. And I won't go into that because it's on our show, but but this, this biological excretion thing, um, yes. In matter of fact, I've traced the lineage of funerary rites throughout history to these beings. Matter of fact, that's what, it not, anyways, but yeah, so <laughs> I can go anywhere and everywhere with this, but uh, yeah, so there, there's there are certain elements to this that are are very troubling that I think the field needs to acknowledge. This is not all blood and light. There are certain issues about this that just raise red flags. Absolutely. Do you think that there is? It's a situation of um, first there were actual for lack of a better term, aliens coming from actual different places in the universe, visiting us in actual craft. And then as time proceeded on and these things became more uh, sort of in the cultural milieu, uh, the, the these demonic influences or forces started taking advantage of that opportunity to disguise themselves as that? Or do you think that they manifested that that sort of archetype to begin with? I think they manifest with an archetype to begin with. Um, okay. Now, I would place a caveat here. Obviously, everything's on the table, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> of I'm not nailing everything to the wall. What I'm suggesting yeah. is, okay, that there is research being done uh, that, you know, puts weight into a certain hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'll tell you, first off, I do not put much, much stock in Zachariah Sitch's work. Nothing against the man. I think he was not a, a good linguist. I think Michael Heiser nailed that to the wall. Okay, there are certain things he manipulated in order, in order to push his agenda. Secondly, we need to understand the Apkalu legend. The Apkalu was not an alien hybrid race. When you get into the symbolism here, what they were dealing with is half fish, half men, half bird, half men. It was essentially the legend of disincarnate consciousness. The idea was that when people die, their soul will leave their body like a bird. And so what happened is a bird flies up. And then they also believe that when people die, they go from a bird to a fish. And so when they when they descended back down, they became half fish, half men. It's no different than the Nephilim hypothesis. What we're dealing with here, at least according to history, was this weird hybridization of death and life at the same time, mm -hmm. where we would have fleshly eyes but ghostly vision. And so this entire narrative here is that, again, our ancestors saw what they believed to be aspects of the afterlife. And what is more alien to us than the afterlife? True. Yeah. <laughs> Stumped. Heavy. <laughs> Heavy. <laughs> so why do you think that there is seems to be a push uh, for this sort of malevolent alien uh, narrative? happening it seems like it's more and more prevalent 
Do you think that's, uh, a, that's in, a concerted effort or in Hollywood in terms of researchers, experiencers or, or like Hollywood? You hear, you hear it all, all, all the above. Uh, but yeah. I was thinking more researchers and experiencers. Oh, uh, I think that, well, I think there's even more so than a concerted effort to silence negative experiences. Mm -hmm. um, I've had people reach out to me who were supposed to be a part of a study or supposed to be a part of a documentary and uh, even been petitioned, give me your story. Let me let me hear it. And then they give them their story and no. Nope. And then you see something that pushes love and light and you wrote and, and then I'm sitting there talking to the individual and I'm thinking, wait a minute, you know, and so there it's weird. Um, first of all, I think that uh, the deeper the research goes, you know, you're going to encounter shadows that are they're going to talk to you, you know, I mean, sure. they're, they're going to, to sit there. And, and, and I think that something is, is more apparent as the day goes on, that these experiences are becoming more comfortable telling their stories. True. Um, I know as a researcher, when I started getting into uh, skin anomalies and religious amulets coming not on, but through the skin to the surface, when I began to lecture about that, I had tons of people reach out to me saying, hey, here's a photograph, here's video, here's my peripheral testimony. And, and what's happened is a lot of, this is crazy, but it's true, it's, uh, maybe this is a human issue um but if the researcher's intellect has not stretched itself outside of their dogma sure they'll get the email but they'll disregard it because it doesn't fit in their blueprint yeah. and so as much as these ufologists wants to poo poo on religious scholars they're also entrenched in dogma they're also very religious about what they have to, what it has to be there and what they have to believe sure um but I, I would, you know, I, I also think that uh, the case studies speak for themselves. And I think that's why some researchers are coming to the front and saying, hey, you know, I was I, I fed into the lie. Um, now, I personally know people who've been at conferences and try to communicate with these researchers saying, hey, listen, you know, you're saying that uh, these people aren't being assaulted. Literally, I'm not exaggerating. I'm telling you straight up. They've been told. I've seen it on it, social media. It makes me mad. A woman, I, this happened to me. Oh, no, no, no. And there is also a counterproductive issue here where people are pushing the love and light and disregarding them, the others. Um, hopefully that answers it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so when we were, I should say, when the alien abduction experience is talked about and how people talk about going up in saucers and getting experimented on and how it has something to do with genetics and a hybrid program. How does that, what are the overlaps between that and the sort of demonic agenda that you're talking about? 100%, 100%. It's not just uh, being experimented on. It's not just a sexual pathology. But if you notice the way that possession turns into pregnancy, it's done. There's no if and no buts about it. It's done. Um, in the 16th century, again, these women were being accosted by entities in their sleep, um, staring into their eyes. Hello, UFO abduction. Mm -hmm. And in this dream state, again, the being manifests as a former lover or as a husband. And in the next day, this dream demon suddenly becomes real to them. Ligature marks, puncture wounds, weird stuff happening to them, skin anomalies. And even more so, the entities were doing these experiments in order to place their consciousness into the individual. Now, there's a peculiar issue here. These women were going to exorcists because there was an alien consciousness inside of them. And so literally you would have someone, and, and I'm going to use women because their sexual pathology was usually women. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm trying to, you know, like, you know, bully or anything. I'm just saying that's what the data says. Sure. But uh, these women were going to exorcists because what was happening is they were having memories that did not belong to them. And where women were saying, hey, listen, like they're in softy Israel, it's a province in Israel, and, uh, and they have memories of eating baguettes, whatever you want to call it, beignets, whatever, in France, but they've never stepped foot in France. Hmm. But I remember it. What is going on? And so the phenomenon of projected and implanted memories first. And so these women go to the exorcist and there is another consciousness that has commandeered their bodies. And so upon interrogation, they're watching this woman. And as they're watching them, there is an entity in their womb, in the fetal position. Mm. Wow. 
Right. This is why I get, I get very, very passionate because, again, if we're ever going to evolve in this research, we've got to step outside of lines. We can't just have ufology. We have to consider all of these case studies in order to get a better understanding of what this phenomenon represents. Uh, but upon examination, the entity did not just possess them with consciousness or, or memories or whatever. The entity had created a hybrid in their bellies, in their wounds, to the point that these Kabbalistic exorcists were performing what's called the Lavouche method. The Lavouche method was placing the thumb on the wrists. And upon placing their thumb on the wrist, they had two heartbeats in one body, hello pregnancy, two pulses in the same body, leading them to ask the most profound question I ever heard in this research, what were these women possessed by the entity or pregnant with it? Which leads us into the understanding of what is truly going on with the hybridization program. We've been focused on DNA, not on consciousness. Mm -hmm. Right. And upon the exorcism, in a sense, when they got rid of the consciousness, the phenomenon took the fetus. Gone. Yeah. Which means, again, it's, it's not just symbiotic, it's embryonic. Mm -hmm. Well, that kind of makes sense in the, in the sort of scientific materialist context of our, of our society right now, because, you know, many people don't even talk about, there's no talk of souls or spirituality or anything that you can't quantify. So <clears throat> it's, it would make sense that we're focusing on genetics and DNA and stuff that we can, you know, measure and... Yeah, that totally makes sense. That, yeah, what what you're bringing to this, uh, whoa, interesting. Well, that was hot. Weird. <laughs> he just disappeared. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, you know, it could go in that direction for sure. That's it's hard to listen to that information and not you know there was a part of me that was starting to go back to kind of how i felt the thing that set off the whole exorcist freak out for me when i was 11 years old or whenever that happened mm -hmm. 14 i think actually i always yeah. want to think that it was much earlier but it was actually later than i thought yeah it was um, earlier for me yes much yeah. much way like too. sinfully earlier yeah way um, too early so a part of me was starting to kind of go there but then you know i had to sort of snip it off because that's exactly where you shouldn't be going if you are yeah. indeed freaked out by it don't freak out on it yeah i mean that's that's the food right there don't lay out a buffet table exactly yeah, yeah. i think that's one of the the benefits of having some of these experiences as a child is that there's an innate knowledge of uh, protection. So yes, your energy is delicious and is something that, that is coveted in to some degree by these um, spirits or these nefarious uh, bad actors, we could call them. <laughs> but I think that also there's also a communion of angels and a communion of higher frequency uh, beings that protect children and protect humans. Yes. And it's just a matter of aligning yourself with those energies. What I find so fascinating is this, uh, the ease in which you can make one choice or the other. So, you know, there's this fascination that people have with horror films or with gore or with these really dark um, subjects. And to me, that's very low frequency energy. So it's, it's easy to kind of uh, acknowledge that and, and observe that and say, uh, oh, um, that's not my bag. That's not what I'm into. Um, because it doesn't really, I don't know, it doesn't really move me or inspire me. I'm more inspired by like 
Vivaldi. <laughs> well, I do, I do like those movies. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's saying like I like all rap music, and I certainly don't. I don't like the majority of rap music, but um, and I don't like the majority of horror movies. Uh, I would say I'm more drawn to the psychological aspects of horror movies. I don't like slasher flicks. I used to think that they were funny when I was in my teens. Um, but I, I think I'm drawn to those, uh, because of the unknown aspect. It's the unknown. It's a, it's a safe place to explore the unknown and maybe it's a little scary, but it's not real scary. It's not like something's in my driveway or on the top of my roof, uh, trying to break into it with an ax scary. It's very safe. Um, so it's a safe way to explore those kinds of territories for me. So I don't feel like I, it, I don't feel like I get emotionally invested in that. You can get emotionally invested in things that are much less um, intense than a horror movie. So I understand where you're coming from for sure. Yeah. I'm too much of an empath. And yeah. so to, to me, I am a energetic miser in some ways because I feel like if I'm going to put my energy in, into something or observe something, I want it to be something healing or something positive. Uh, and I can see when I get hooked by a loop and those loops can be, it's more to, I, this is what I find fascinating is that it's more like a, in a social media realm where the algorithm is showing me like a flood or, you know, a, a thwarted kidnapping or some animal being hurt or something really that that's real um, but it's real horror. And I feel like that's just as much of a energetic hook or loop as watching a horror movie. To me so I have to be very cognizant of that and say, okay, I'm not going to give myself, I'm not going to go down this drain because that's not going to serve me. That's not raising my frequency to a higher level by watching or observing that stuff. I agree. Um, in the sense that I don't, on a social media feed, I don't see that stuff. I scroll past those things or I block that person, even though it may just be on my feed because somebody I know likes that or they retweeted it or whatever. Yeah. That I don't like uh, because it's real and it's, you know, it exists and, and, and there's real life consequences. Um, but a Ari Aster movie, Bo is afraid. <laughs> It's exempt from this, but is a freaky experience, but it's a safe freaky experience. So anyway, I, yeah. I don't mean to get right. caught up in that. But the difference to me is that both are being manifested. Someone took the time to write that script. They conjured that world. So it is real, even though it's uh, play acted or has characters in it. Again, it is some dark energy that is feeding those script writers or feeding those actors or feeding the set designers or all the people who are involved in that. So to me, it's the, the exact same thing. It doesn't matter if it's quote unquote real or if it's Hollywoodized and manufactured, this is still hooking into the same energetic thread. Yeah. It's not that way for me. Um, so yes, fortunately I was able to navigate past that point and and just kind of see it for what it is. Uh I think it's easy also to uh get depressed by that information or, or to feel overwhelmed by that information um because that's his I mean that's his area of study, that's what he's passionate about. So he spends a lot of time there and reports on it. Yeah. Uh, so it's easy to get the misconception that that's what the world is written yeah. with. Um, I found it fascinating that he's not giving a, a solution. So he's not like, and buy my salt, <laughs> you well, know, and wrap he, your, he wrap your house around it. Or he whatever. sees a solution. He's, there's right. still a lot of questions to be answered. Right. But I think some people are trying to sell shit <laughs> and that's their whole game is that they, share this scary stuff or this dark stuff and then they sell you the solution yeah yeah 
Sure. I understand. Like somebody that I've mentioned <laughs> recently on Telegram <laughs> that you mentioned that you saw on Telegram that had a solution that they were peddling. Um, <laughs> so yes, uh, it's easy to get, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm wondering if we should just make this Patreon only, uh, in some senses, because I certainly don't want to freak people out. Um, and this is kind of dark material. Um, I don't know. We can discuss it after. We yeah. Get off this. I, I, it's funny because I see, again, I don't take the place of powerlessness because I don't give these things. I, I don't give them. Uh, I think I've I've already danced with the devil. So for me, I see it and I'm like, yeah, but you can get to the other side of this. There is a there is redemption. There is sure, but, there is healing possible. Yes. But you also speak <laughs> about the the responsibility of the artist to not release things into the world that may potentially have a negative effect. So that's more what I'm thinking of. I, I was able to navigate past this, but somebody might not be able to navigate past this or might get snagged or it might bring up something for them or whatever. I'm, it's, I'm just thinking about it right now. I'm not putting, I'm not saying we should definitely just keep this behind the paywall or not, but something I'm considering. Um, so yeah, I thought it was interesting his take on uh, aliens being demons, which I've heard before, but more from more kind of religious zealots who think that anything that wasn't in the Bible is a demon or, you know, anything remote viewing is Satanism or whatever. So uh, it was interesting to hear his take because there are a lot of correlations. There are a lot of overlaps between those experiences. Um, but I'm also a, um, you know, not, uh, not a black and white. Everything is not black and white. There's, a, it's more of all of the above. Um, and this makes it seem like it's black and white. Like all, there's no aliens, and this is just what are, they're just demons, and you, it's all trickery, and you're all, you're being misled by these things that are just trying to manipulate you. But yeah, but I don't again, think that that's all that it is. Again, I don't think uh, when we talk about aliens or or um, extraterrestrials, I think there is just this this kind of myopic perspective that it's only something from outer space. When yeah. I don't necessarily believe that, I and I either. think I think that's something that it's important to consider here. Then, when we're talking about these energies, they're not necessarily just one. They're not from one place. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So uh, something that is a um, alien or a unidentified flying object, there's no, no certainty that that thing has come from another atmosphere or another solar system or another universe. We have no idea. So yes, some of these things could be demonic. They could be from some dark place within the earth's core or they could be from another planet we don't know but to assume that it is all one thing i i think that that's that's uh maybe a little that's painting with a broad brush that's my diplomatic way of saying that your way of saying exactly what i said mm -hmm. yeah yeah um but it came out of my mouth <laughs> that's why that's where the your comes in exactly yes <laughs> okay let's get lost in a semantic wonderland shall we <laughs> <laughs> you looked possessed there for a second when it's you just, made that face <laughs> it's just caffeine i think it's the lighting <laughs> could be that too because your eyes looked glowy and freaky yeah exactly yeah it's that's the, the that's the demon face <laughs> but it's not a demon Good. <laughs> okay. So you had fun? It was an interesting uh, conversation for you. Um I yeah, I mean I, I think it's 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 complicated. It's not something that I feel that I I don't feel like he clearly answered the questions that we were um posing. I feel like like he brought his own 
research into the discussion. And so the, I felt like there wasn't the exchange was interesting, but it wasn't like it wasn't getting into the meat of what some of the questions were. And I wanted to, like, I wanted to know what his feedback was on certain things that I was asking. And I think if you throw someone a curveball, sometimes that happens. It's like, okay, this is what I know. And so this is what I'm going to share. Um, but I wanted to know what his opinions were of these other aspects that we were talking about, because I do think that this is, this is a spectrum of, uh, demonic energies that we're talking about. Um, and I was wondering, okay, well, what is, what is the overlord of that? What is the name of this thing that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. And we didn't, he didn't really answer that question. And I'm curious because I think that there is a religious aspect where people say, oh, this is Satan or this is Lucifer or Baphomet or whatever. They have their, their, um, their specific kind of idea of what it is based on their religious beliefs. But I'm wondering what's the step above that? What is the puppet master that's running those shows? Well, I think that there is a, a, an a aspect to perception where I think that our perceptions play a, m a more important role in any exchange that we have with things that we perceive as external than we would like to give it credit for. So we place our own templates on things that we perceive, uh, whether those be psychological templates. Sometimes we see things completely differently, even though we're all maybe looking at the same thing. So I wonder, too, how that plays a role in something like this. Totally. There's lots of evidence that suggests that poltergeists aren't autonomous entities, but they're some sort of some some sort of phenomenon that's happening unbeknownst to the person that it seems to be revolving around that's being um, fed by that uh, and and orchestrated by that, but not on any conscious level. So it would be interesting to find out if there's how much in a, of an objective or a subjective, I should say, um, aspect there is to the way that those things are perceived. He, we, he talked about um, those things kind of knowing what kind of strings or what, what kind of buttons right. to push right. with you as if they have access to your database. But right. maybe it's the template and that's the way that you're perceiving it because of your perceptions. Exactly. So it's like chicken or the egg, which came first. Yeah. I think there's, there's a element. And again, this is like what I was trying to dig into a little bit with him is there's a cultural element. So yeah. someone that comes from a specific culture that has specific lore, they're going to draw the, that lore into their perception of what they're viewing or feeling. So if it's a, uh, indigenous culture, if it is a Alaskan culture, if it's a Eastern Indian culture, the the de demonology is going to be from that their religious base. Mm -hmm. So it could all be the same thing, but because I'm bringing my culture into that, I'm going to perceive it as this thing. So there was that aspect of it. And when I was talking about the government, I wasn't talking about the United States government. I was talking about bigger picture government, like all government, because these are all, they're all in, colluding together. The world so, government. Right. So it's not just, oh, it's, you know, the, the United States government that's involved. It's like, no, it's every government body that wants to have control over its people. Yeah. So it's all of them that that may be involved with these energies but again who is the master of those people and who's the master like so we know okay it's the rockefellers it's the rothschilds okay so that's one level but who's above the yeah. above the above the above exactly those are the people that we just know those are the figureheads that we can yeah. point at yeah those are the tomatoes at. those are the puppets yeah. but you know is it is it the reptilians and who's the puppet master of the reptilians? Sure. Like, so that's where well, I'm kind of leading. 
I mean, I would say that everything leads back to source, whatever source is, because uh, it all see. It seems that it would have to come from one place, originate at one place at one point. That there could be many stages and levels and dimensions between that one point and where we're at now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I always wonder that too. That's that's that kind of the 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 uh, the infinite hall of mirrors that I would get myself into when I was a child, um, probably around eight or nine, which I've told you about and I've mentioned on the show before. Asking, okay, God created the universe. That's what I'm told. Well, who created God? Then who created the creator of God? Then who created right. the creator of the creator? Of, I mean, and then just get, taking that back infinitely like then you realize everything is so small and infinitesimal well you know when i had that session with cheyenne and we were talking about you know the jab and the potential of you know just all of that shit that was going on back then and she said you know everything is perfect everything is exactly as it's supposed to be and I really took umbrage with that, and I still do. It's like, no, a, a child being tortured is not the way it's supposed to be. The, you know, ritual murder is not the way it's supposed to be. These things aren't fucking perfect. And I'm never going to co-sign on, on this, you know, perspective that everything that is happening is, is exactly as it's supposed to. No, it's not. There's some, the, the reason, and we, we, you and I have talked about this before, where there's a reason I'm observing this. So the example I always give is I went to clean this house and something drew me outside. And when I went outside, I looked down on the rug and it had been raining and there was this worm that was caught in the threads of this carpet outside and i very carefully got this worm free and then it like looked at me and then you know it got away and i remember thinking that little creature called me into this like from an infinite perspective you could see like i had some karmic relationship with that worm and that worm called me out side to save it and i saved it and then it went on and maybe it was bird food or whatever but whatever there was some relationship that happened there and so my i fulfilled my task by letting that worm go now from a buddhist perspective you could say well that worm had its karma and you interrupted that karma by saving that worm but is wasn't it my karma to observe that worm and save it and didn't we have some agreement that that was going to happen so knowing that torture is happening knowing that people are getting hurt knowing that there are transcendent moments where people are having these epiphanies and and raising their frequency or raising their awareness isn't isn't part of our story knowing that and understanding that and maybe influencing those things in some way. And that's why we see them. Well, that situation between you and the worm sounded pretty perfect. So I don't think that, I think the mistake that people make with that is everything is perfect. Uh, is that that's a call to passivity. I don't think that is a call to passivity. If you were moved to go outside and free that worm, then that sounds like it was it meant to be. That was something that was meant to happen. I don't think that that means we should just sit back and do nothing or not interact with the world or other people or try to change a situation that looks bad and you can actually affect it. Um, so, yeah, I, I I understand where you're coming from and I understand that everything is perfect. Um, I think that sometimes in a world that seems so out of balance, um, to feel that, to be able to perceive that chaos that, that, that seems to be happening in a, in a particular situation as a one step towards non-chaos or towards some sort of order where everything is more, um, better for all of all the beings that are 
participating in that situation. It's hard to see it that way sometimes. Um, so I think that what she was saying is in the bigger, big, 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 big infinitesimal picture, then it's okay. It's going to be all right. But I don't think that that means that we should be inactive and not reach out to people or let something happen that you know is wrong or is causing someone pain without trying to just help them in a way or try to, you know, cheer somebody up or give somebody advice that might help them out or give a homeless person $10 bill or something like that. So that's my take. Yeah. I think that like when Arvo and I were, when I was driving him to school and we saw that coyote that had been hit by a car and we stopped and I called animal control, I called the police and they called animal control and they got someone there. One thing that I realized in that dynamic was what was being affected was not the life of that coyote. What because that life had already left. What was being affected was all of the people that drove by who observed what was happening, that someone stopped to give aid. And sometimes maybe that's where the lesson is. It's not necessarily you are um, impacting or influencing something that's already beyond yeah. the point of saving, but Adjusture. it's it's other people seeing that and saying, I, the people who stopped and said, what can I do to help you? Like, yeah. how, ca how can, how can I be involved? I think there's a greater lesson there, which is we all are part of this symphony and we all have a role in which instrument we're playing in that moment. For sure. It's, it's a reminder of interconnectedness uh, when people think that it's a hippie notion and you've said it sometime before too that everything is interconnected i think that's reminds us how interconnected we are and, and to be a present uh, actor in a situation like that and to do the best thing that you feel is possibly can happen there regardless of what the result is the effort and gesture in and of itself communicates something to everybody that witnessed that and brought those parts out of, of of those parts in them out of them or to the surface and yeah i mean it, it's sort of culminated and coagulated positive energy and positive yeah or didn't because there were plenty of cars that zoomed by and didn't stop because they had some place to go and they were on their journey and they had their rationale not to stop mm -hmm. so i think it's not one or the other. It's both at the same yeah, time. Absolutely. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds subtly dismissive, but on that <laughs> note, we've been babbling for almost a half hour. Yep. Um, thank you all so much for listening. Hopefully you're not freaked out. Um, I think inevitably uh, we all have uh, much more power than we give ourselves credit for. And as I said in the conversation, it's more a situation of ignorance more than anything, I think, as far as our potential place in potential situations such as that. Um, but yeah, the the point is to not get freaked out. Uh, to, this is just a, a conversation about somebody's ideas about these things based on experiences that he's had and they have a relevance, but they also are just one out of very many ways of looking at things. Well, and the, the important thing to remember is if you open yourself up to something that you potentially cannot control what is going to come in so be very protective of your energy and your spirit and your space and what you invite into that uh, the one thing that he said that i have had an experience with is that when you vibrate at a higher frequency you become like a moth to flame so or flame to moth <laughs> so things will be attracted to you and you have to be very cautious because you can see that thing 
but that thing can see you too. So just err on the side of caution when it comes to doing any type of uh, ritualistic magic, make sure you are protecting yourself and your environment. And there are things you can do definitely to protect yourself. Um, I do this thing that I call shields up when I go out into the world, if I'm going to go out into a crowd where I literally put like a egg of light around me and I, it's an impenetrable shield that people cannot uh, pierce unless I allow them in. So, you know, just make sure you are, you guard your words and your space and the people that you love. And, you know, I think words are spells and they are magic and we can do magic and uh, affect and influence the things that we allow in our sphere, in our, our environment. We are not powerless. That's the one thing that I think it's important for us to share with our audience is that this is one person's experience, but we are all individuals and we all have sovereignty and we have the right to say no. I do not consent. I do not consent. Contact can be had at the Melt Podcast at protonmail.com or Hunter Muse at protonmail.com. Calm. Calm. Hey, yeah, there like you it. go. It's exactly. Yeah. We should change it to that. Yeah. If there is such a thing. Let's make it. In the alternate internet. Yeah. The alternet. Yes. All right. <laughs> Wonderful people. Thank you all so much for giving us your valuable attention and time. Yes. And hopefully you feel it was well spent. Yes. We love you. We're yes. sending you good energy and vibes. And let's raise the conversation and our frequency together. Let's do it. Until next time. <laughs> yeah.